Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Franco Perez. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind please taking an extra 30 seconds and head over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making my day with that five-star review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Franco Perez is on a mission to create affordable housing in Silicon Valley. Inspired to reimagine mobile homes and expand affordable housing opportunities, he discovered that the Bay Area's mobile home parks offer an abundance of underused land with great growth potential. After years of dedication to his vision, Franco has established a devoted team of like-minded individuals who strive to unlock the pathway to home ownership and help families establish financial security where it might otherwise seem impossible. Franco, we're excited to welcome you to the show, brother. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here too. And I, it, I was mentioning earlier that I feel like we've met many times before actually. So it's really cool to connect here. Yeah, totally. I know you spoke at MHI, Congress and Expo, you know, this year, and then also at SECO. So I'm excited to, to have you, you know, jump on here and talk about affordable housing. So this will be fun. I'm excited as well. Awesome, man. Would you mind starting out by telling us a little about your story and how in the world you got into manufactured housing of all things? <laughs> yeah. So I guess it really kind of stems down to long story short, I was a immigrant family. For, I had immigrant parents from the Philippines, moved over, uh, made their way to San Jose, California, had a weird situation where my parents divorced. My dad was a main breadwinner and I was left with my single mom and my younger sister at about 17, 18 years old. And from there, I immediately kind of had to give up a lot. I had to quit school, start working right away. And I remember at the end of every single month, uh, the pain that I felt having to just gather as much money as I could to just to pay for rent. And that to me was the beginning of kind of my learning lesson of understanding like, hey, why is it that the world's this way? I feel like we're good people. And why is it that the wealthy get to benefit from home ownership while, you know, while people like me or the working class can only rent and, and it's very difficult to own. And then from there, I kind of worked my way to being a real estate agent, did that for a long while, hated it actually. Um, I mainly just hated the part of having to tell people, hey, you don't make enough, you don't have enough saved. And unfortunately, if you make more or if you save more, I can help you later down the line. But the truth of it is, is that I knew that they were in my shoes that I felt back then. And it's hard to find guidance when you don't, when you aren't in the right position. So dedicated my life to trying to find, I left being a regular real estate agent, dedicated my life to try to find a way just to help make homes more accessible for families of working class and to get out of that rental rat race. And I accidentally came across mobile home parks. And, and from what I thought mobile home parks were, I thought they were like trailer trash communities for criminals and drug dealers. And because that's what we see on you see in the media, but come to find out there's a lot of beautiful things about mobile home parks and communities. And, and the main thing that I loved is actually diving into it is that there are working class families starting their wealth building journey inside these communities. And this is something that's really missed and really underrated. We see that this is a place that people can actually feel financially secure in an expensive area like our area, which is the Silicon Valley, which is more expensive than anywhere else, uh, than most places in the country. And this has allowed for people to feel financially secure or build themselves out of being in a, mo a mobile homeowner into regular real estate owner and dedicated building a business around helping people get out of that rental rat race into mobile home ownership and helping people transition from there to real estate. And now we convert a lot of old mobile homes and convert them into large, beautiful 
two thousand square foot, twelve foot high ceiling homes, and and breaking stigmas as much as we can. So that's, that's kind so of awesome where yeah. we're at today. <laughs> no, that is so fun, man. And I I think it's important to note, right, that in San Jose, California, the average home value is over one point three million dollars, right? And you know the average rental amount for an eight hundred square foot apartment is over three thousand dollars a month. So you know, obviously big numbers in an area that desperately needs affordable housing and manufactured housing, you know, is, is a big provider of that, right? Because who else, or where else is, you know, police officers, you know, new nurses, teachers, mechanics, restaurant workers, where are they going to live, right? You know, you, you want, you want and need these people in any community to be able to, you know, have a good quality of life and you want it to be a win-win where they can afford to live there and they don't have to bus in from an hour away just to, you know, to work these jobs. So it's desperately needed. It's so, uh, it's so, so important. So, you know, tell us about, you know, how manufactured housing is, is playing a role specifically. What are you seeing? I know you have a dealership, you have a brokerage, you also do some consulting for mobile home park owners. Like how big is manufactured housing in San Jose? And what don't we know about, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this area and how it's playing a role? Yeah. And you touched on a lot of things there. And I want to get to both the two important things is one is a lot of people don't know about mobile home parks, right? And, and I lived in San Jose for several years and, and you don't, people don't have an excuse to go into a mobile home community unless you know somebody that lives there. And, and so to my, to my surprise, in our county, we have over 60 mobile home parks within that county. And most people don't know about these. And, and they aren't, uh, in many metro cities, they're spread out throughout and there's several out there. And the second part is you touched on the, the housing situation and the actual housing problem, right? On average, and I'm going to talk about our area in the Silicon Valley, but I was mentioning to you before is that this is a housing problem that might be unique to our area, but it's going to be a problem that will come up in many metro growing cities as well, right? So the prices I'm going to mention might be higher than most. I, I don't want you to feel like it's unrelevant, but the ratios are kind of the same. But like you said, a two bedroom apartment here goes for about $3,300 a month for rent. An average single family home is around that one3 $1.4 million uh, price point. How does somebody that's renting at that at that amount ever dream of owning a piece of real estate one day? Because that gap is too far to reach, it then becomes kind of a dream and kind of it becomes people start to lose faith that they'll ever be able to grow their wealth, right? We need a bridge in between or a stepping stone in between. And what I love about mobile homes is that it's a perfect in-between. It's a hybrid of both. So the owners are able to own the asset that's above the land. They don't actually own the land, which some people see as a huge flaw. But the truth is, it ha it's the big pro is that it's a more attainable purchase price and they get to control the asset above, right? So an average mobile home in our area is about 300000 And if someone were to purchase a single family home, if they wanted to buy one, 10% of 1.3 million is $130,000. Whereas if they wanted to purchase a mobile home, 10% of 300,000 is only $30,000 as a down payment. Now their mortgage, their space rent would be about $1,000 and their mortgage would look somewhere around $2,600, right? So with that being said, this allows for someone that's renting at $3,300 just to pay just a little bit more, but start to get a lot of the benefits of home ownership, which is leveraging a loan to build their net worth, which is appreciation, which a lot of people don't understand these appreciate in many areas. And they, it also allows for them to get tax benefits as well. And these benefits of home ownership is what allows for them to switch their current personal cash flow from full rent and ending up with nothing to a better model with the mobile home ownership that they're able to have part of that cash flow going back to something that they can sell later down the line. And this is part, you know, this is that zero to one mentality, helping people get understand personal cash flow and, and get them out of where they're at to a better cash flow to, to then sell their mobile home later 
and then be able to attain housing, right? Because the way it is now, there's a huge wealth gap and we have to keep that bridge and keep stepping stones in between. Totally agree. What mistakes have you seen, you know, manufactured housing investors make, you know, in, in your area? I know you've been doing this a while. So there's a lot of different angles, right? So there's the park owners and then there's the residents themselves. And, you know, what's beautiful about what we do is that it benefits kind of all parties and the social elements of it as well. Uh, I think some mistakes uh, that I've seen on the park owner side is, you know, thinking that they can just drastically, you know, there's different, um, every jurisdiction has different laws and, and there's some entities that will, that will drastically increase rents thinking that this is going to be the overall solution right away. Whereas we see, we want to leverage the tool of them having this home as an asset and, and allowing for them to take care of the community and building on whether it's clubhouse and amenities or whether it's allowing more access for the residents themselves to upgrade their old home to a new one. And that's exactly kind of what we're known for as well. It's like, hey, a lot of these people don't know that the the value of what their home is. And, and if we teach them that this is an asset that they have, and we enable for them to understand that you can invest in your home, replacing your old one for a new one, and this becomes a beautiful asset that that you got a loan for, but the end result is a higher asset for you. This also, without the park owner having to put any value into that home, raises the comps of the community, which allows more people to build up their homes as well, right? And that whole concept and model is the beauty of like what we do and how it benefits the park owners, it benefits the residents, it makes them feel more happy and comfortable that there's newer homes around. And it also helps them understand that their home is a valuable asset and it appreciates by beautifying the park altogether. Gotcha. So you're a real, you know, promoter and fan of, you know, owning manufactured homes to, as a wealth building vehicle, right? For like the, the, the service workers, the working class. Is that a good synopsis? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we, we work as well with park owners. Also, we help kind of do consulting as far as how do we fill in their lots and that sort of thing. Also, we just try to generally do all around mobile home stuff as well. So very cool. Yeah. My, my wife has an aunt that lives in a manufactured home in, in Huntington beach. And we went to her community and uh, went out to dinner with them. And it was just amazing. I mean, they're a couple blocks away from the beach, you know, and what they're, you know, they own the home, but they pay, you know, space rent. And, you know, it may seem expensive, but this was the only way for them to live in Huntington Beach, which is an amazing, beautiful area. So I think there is, I think there's that stigma, right? Of like, oh, you know, aunt, aunt so-and-so, you know, lives in a mobile home. Oh, but it's, it's two blocks away from the beach and it's in Huntington Beach, California which is an amazing area that they can walk to downtown Huntington beach. So there's like a, there's a stigma around living in, in a mobile home. And I'm curious how that stigma looks in San Jose. And, yeah. you know, if it's, if it's still there, you know, where people I think are choosing like a, it's a lifestyle decision more so than like a, you know, something you tell your friends at the country club. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, you touched on a very important thing is it, it is that stigma, right? And unfortunately, our only association with mobile homes, or like I mentioned earlier, is what we know from movies and TV. What we see is from Breaking Bad or like Eminem videos. It's the lowest of low, but we have to understand that just like apartment buildings, right? You know, hey, there's apartment buildings that you don't want your kids going around. It's unsafe and that sort of thing. But there's also luxury style apartments, right? Where it's just resort like that sort of thing. And it's the same spectrum with mobile home parks. There are bad, trashy parks, right? But there's also beautiful, luxurious communities where with tennis courts, spas, gyms, and that sort of thing that shouldn't be ignored and should be known that we should understand the asset class as a beautiful thing as well. And it's that yeah. misunderstanding and it's that false stigma that causes us to feel like this is not uh, a good thing. How hard would it be to get a manufactured housing community 
developed, you know, from scratch in San Jose today? Oh, almost impossible. <laughs> but, you know, you know, we see in San Jose, it's a very dense area. Now, now, you know, it's only until recently that we started, people started to understand why mobile homes are so important, that sort of thing. To be honest, in very in the dense core of these cities, it's going to be very difficult. Now, the outskirts, however, is going to be a very viable thing, right? So I was just helping consult for a friend over in this Reno area. There's this Tesla Gigafactory that just built east of Reno, and they're trying to find the best way to get housing for their workers, right? So this became the best use case for them to want to develop. What we've realized is that with regular stick-built housing, this is built all the way, you know, if we look back, it's built the same way it was 100 years back, and there was no improvement. But when we look at everything we own, the phones, the cars, it was all improved by building out on on an assembly line, right? And that's what's allowed for it to be accessible for everybody. And, and I use this analogy a lot, but cars were originally only built for the rich and wealthy. And it was only until they built it on an assembly line in a streamlined way that we got cars accessible to everybody. And that's exactly what we're doing with mobile homes. We're building these homes in a controlled environment in a factory on an assembly line. And that assembly line allows us to build with quality, to build, to, to make the, uh, the, the labor costs way more effective. And in the end of the assembly line, having a much more affordable and attainable and very quality home at the end, right? And, and that's the whole goal and the premise of why we're doing what we're doing is we have to, we have to lower the cost and keep it attainable for everyone. And if you see the videos that we do in these factories, it's it's amazing how streamlined this is, and, and people have to see how beautiful this whole process is, and it is the future, whether we like it or not. And I think you know one aspect that gets overlooked is how green this initiative is, right? Uh, I was shocked at MHI to see that Clayton Homes only has one trash can full of waste for every manufactured home that they build. You know, I, I, there's a housing development going up around where I live. And literally there's dumpsters out front of every home and it's like, they're getting dumped once a week. You know, these are 40 cubic yard uh, dumpsters that are, you know, every week getting, getting torn down or, you know, trash is getting filled and getting taken off to the landfill. So it's, it's yeah. way less efficient, right? It's so much more green. The carbon emissions are way better. And just like you said, the actual stats that we pulled from that is that every single site built home in a traditionally built home that's about 1500 square foot there's three there's more than three huge dumpster trucks of trash because you know they have to that's the easiest way to get rid of that right now when we do a factory built home in a, a 1500 square foot the same the same size home, there's less than a third of a dumpster truck of trash, right? And the key thing to understand is that because we're in a factory, there's so much more of the reusability of the material. When they cut a big piece of lumber, they know that if they cut that piece, they have a place to store the extra material over to another department that might need it, right? Whereas on a regular site, the easiest thing for us to do is just trash it and get rid of it. But because it's in an assembly line in a process way, we can now optimize. How do we waste less material? How do we, how do we use, how do we build better quality? And it's the same as, you know, car production. And, and that's exactly what we have to do with housing. And just like you said, it's great for the environment. It's great for the social element of affordability. And it also provides quality jobs for people in many areas that need it. Right. And I was just at a factory last week. Uh, I I also got to point this out too: is that on a regular job construction site in a traditional home, it's all men working there. I was at a factory last week, and there was so many women jobs that were created because they're in a factory. They don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. They can do a lot of things that don't require you know, it, and it creates equal opportunity in jobs like that situation too. That's a great point. Yeah. Wow. I never thought of that. And yeah, that's that's so true. So obviously, Franco, you love manufactured housing. I'm a big fan of it. There's a stigma that we acknowledge, but there's a lot of benefits to it. But what's the let's play devil's advocate here. Why why would someone not want to live in a manufactured home? 
I think it's a lot of misunderstanding. I think we do have to understand that every market in every city has its own different problems and priorities. I think one big thing that's against our industry today is a lot of this not in my backyard mentality, right? And and a, a huge energy of that is from the fact that we feel like having a mobile home park in our city brings in bad quality people. And that's where our homeless communities are coming from or our drug problem is coming stemming from. And I think that has to all go away because, you know, we have to really understand the, the, the what these communities look like in real life and not just what we see on TV, not just what we take in from the news or the media. And why would someone not want to live in it? I mean, we have people coming from both ends. We have people downsizing. We have people coming out of renting and upsizing into these. But I think one of it is really stems to that stigma. The stigma. Yeah, the stigma of, oh, you live in a, a trailer home or something like that, right? Which, you know, I mean, you were at the convention in Seco in Atlanta, and there was uh, several Cavco homes that were set up there. And I walked through all of them, and it was absolutely stunning. I mean, if you haven't walked through a manufactured home in, you know, ever, or, or at least in the last 10 years, they look completely different. I mean, they are full on regular homes, right? But I think the, the stigma is a big reason why someone wouldn't want to live there. Uh, one thing just from, I mean, I mean, and you rehab a ton of manufactured homes too, is that it's different, right? There's different size drywall, there are different size windows, different size doors, the bathroom, you know, size of the tubs and, the, you know, everything is, is different sizes and special order. So renovating manufactured homes can actually be quite cumbersome, right? Because you have to order, you know, stuff from a, a preferred manufacturer supplier, right? So that, mm -hmm. I, I think that's one thing that caught me off guard is like, oh, we can't just go up to Home Depot and, and buy a tub and put it in here. No, you got to like special order the fiberglass, you know, certain size. Would you agree with that from your experience? It it is it is kind of a a tedious thing, but there's usually some fixes to get for that. And and I I'm a part of like a lot of factory consulting as well, and we've actually discussed that we have to start having more universal products, you know. But you know when it when it comes to any industry or any space, it's like what's more important than the other, right? Is like hey, do we streamline price and value, or do we make it easier for someone to fix up? Uh, an older home. And there's not much we can do about the homes that were already built in the past. And that's where a lot of these issues really come from is these past 1970s or 1980s homes, they did have a lot of, you know, they still use whatever piping it, what material it was back then. And we don't have that material anymore. Or because like we mentioned, it's a, they, they have a specific manufacturer that they have to get from. But do we feel like the more important value is getting an affordable home? for a family, that is going to be one of the flaws is, is maintaining it sometimes. Right? Yeah. Maintaining but, it but the, know, might be a little more expensive. Yeah. But the pro, but the pro of it is it's actually something you own and it's kind of, you know, it's like we could date, we could play devil at devil's advocate on both sides. It's like, Hey, should I rent where I don't have to worry about maintaining anything? Or do I have an asset that will appreciate and, and that sort of thing. But I, I don't mind taking care of these little you know, five hundred dollar fixes sure, a year. Sure. And, and Franco, you know, in your part of the the country, right, in San Jose, you know, what has a manufactured? If you bought it brand new from the factory back in two thousand, you know, and now it's twenty twenty three, what type of appreciation? If you bought a manufactured home in a mobile home park, what type of appreciation would you have seen over that twenty three year hold period? It. In the last two years, we've seen an appreciation of more than 22%, right? And that's for an average 1970s home, right? Which is, you know, kind of kind of huge. Uh, you know, you own something that's worth 100, they immediately just by owning it, not doing anything, they've, uh, they've appreciated their net worth by $20,000 or more, right? And, and that upside appreciation can can make a big difference for a working class family. Totally. Uh, what's the biggest threat to manufactured housing in, in your eyes? Um, I'd say 
It's hard for me to to think of something about that, but I'd say probably these entities that feel like there's um that feel like this isn't the right space for it, um, that want to close down communities. We have a lot of conversations around that lately. And that's something we have to, that's part of our agenda is protecting and preserving these communities to make sure that it is there to have housing accessible for people. Yeah. And like in San Jose, I'm sure, you know, if if we take the the square foot right of a mobile home park one of those 60 parks and we said hey we're gonna you know tear this down and we're gonna build 300 apartments here you know that probably pencils out right that the numbers probably make sense if you're renting those apartments at three four five grand a month so Which has how, yeah how is how is the municipality you know zoning and, and so forth uh making sure that doesn't happen Good, good, great question. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I'm a big part of that as well is that, you know, when one of the big things that people, that's a big thing that people, homeowners of mobile homes are very much afraid of. But what what they don't realize is that there's a very much like an eminent domain uh, approach to all of these, right? So this just happened in San Jose about a year and a half ago where a community was, purchased and they did development uh, of apartments and that sort of thing. But the key thing that ended up happening at the end of that is that the residents of that community ended up getting 160% of what their home value was worth. So they did a full appraisal effect of what their home was worth. And they had the option of either offering up an apartment to one of those families or getting them what their value of their home would be plus the moving costs of having them move, right? So the key element is they still have that asset. They're not going to, I think a lot of people are fearful of if if that happens, their $300,000 investment is just completely gone, right? We have to understand that banks are smart people too. If we're getting a loan from this entity and they're investing 80% loan to value on our mobile home, they know their protections as well. And they're not going to make a huge risk knowing that this can one day close and then their assets gone. So there are several protections that protect the residents themselves, but there are going to be times where that is the right thing for that city, right? And and But the key thing is making sure that everyone gets what they deserve as far as compensation. Totally. Yeah, there's a right way to go about it, right? Yeah. So a lot of our listeners are passive investors, you know, typically investing in apartments and things like that. Uh, if you were going to passively invest into a mobile home park, you know, with another operator or something, what would you say are like the most important things that you'd look for in the deal or in this the, in the park itself? You know, I'm a big nerd on like the economics of areas. I I think that's a key thing to understand. Where are the jobs coming from? Where's the money flowing? And is this a future big need um, for that area, right? So a lot of markets in North Carolina, a lot of markets in Florida where, where you're at, you know, if we understand the migration of people going in versus going out, and if we understand if housing is going to be a future problem four or five years down the line, that's typically an area that I'd like to invest in. Um, Bozeman, Montana was something my good friend noticed that we, a, a while back, and it became a huge appreciating area from there. And when you know econ and when you know mar- understand markets, you kind of have this uh, insight of even if I make a ton of mistakes on the investments that you have a lot of wiggle room to be safe and, and and way way more room to mess up and still come out positive. So that's how I would look at things. That's a great tip. Yeah. So looking at population trends, you know, a website that we look at is bestplaces.net and they will show you, hey, what's the population, you know, look like over the last five years? You know, or is it going up? Is it going down? A place like Bozeman. Is just skyrocketing, right? Like 20, 30% per year population growth. So when you have that happening, right, what does the what does the value of homes do? What's well, skyrocketing as well? And it's pricing people out. I remember 
in Denver, you know, there was there was insane appreciation year over year because there was just such high net migration numbers. And what happens is these these working class people that we talked about earlier get priced out fast. And that's where manufacturing manufactured housing becomes such a viable option. Um, and it's just getting over that stigma, right? So, I mean, I'm curious because obviously San Jose is is it, like exactly like that, right? But how are people getting over that stigma? I mean, is it do they need to just go walk through a manufactured home and see that it's not eight mile, you know? Or, or how are you <laughs> getting people, you know, through that hurdle? Good question. What's really made it for us has been our YouTube channel, and and I think part of what I've realized nerding out on mobile homes is that you know we can't get past that stigma and how do we learn what younger generations are going to think too but younger generations learn through video and visuals right and that's what exactly what we're doing now is we create video content of inside the factory this is how windows are placed this is how women are able to have jobs in this area this is how we protect the quality of how this roof will look and and then also showcasing tours of the beautiful homes we build at the end product. Hey, this is a 12 foot high ceiling, quartz countertop, waterfall style island, stainless steel appliances, and it's 1600 square foot, three bedroom, two bath. People have to see this in real life to believe it. There's so much fake concepts yeah. out there, and you know, and, and I love it. I I, I like innovation and that sort of thing. But what we have to realize is this is an already working thing. And this is yeah. already happening for several years. And we're building over, I believe it's about 100,000 manufactured homes a year is that's already working. And, and it's something that's already uh, helping families. And, and it's just all, we have to teach through video. And yeah. as much as I sometimes hate being on video. Sometimes I, I know the value of it and I know how it's going to help people understand it. And I feel in my opinion, that's the only way. Yeah. Franco Perez is, is making mobile homes cool again. I mean, I, <laughs> I love it. I love your YouTube channel. It's super cool. It's educational and, and adding a lot of value. So, uh, Franco, if, if any of our listeners would like to get a hold of you or, you know, find out more about you, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, all of our links are on www.franco.tv or you can just Google Franco Mobile Homes. You should be able to find our stuff there. Definitely awesome. take a look at our, we also have like 3D tours. If you're listening to this, I know it's a podcast. So I urge people to take a look at like these Matterport 3D tours of the homes. And really, we really do, our team does a good job of pushing the stigmas with the smart tech and all of that. So I'd love for you guys to be able to kind of see that firsthand. Super cool, Franco. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And I love what you're doing as well. So thanks for doing this. Yeah, that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, are you getting value out of this show? If so, would you mind please going over to iTunes and leaving the show a quick five-star review? I have a goal of hitting over 100 five-star reviews by the end of 2021. And it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help contribute to that. Thanks ahead of time for making my day with your five-star review of the show.